The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus said to the crowds, This is how it is with the kingdom of God. It is as if a man were to scatter seed on the land, and would sleep and rise night and day, and through it all the seed would sprout and grow. He knows not how. Of its own accord the land yields fruit. First the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe, he wields the sickle at once, for the harvest has come. He said, To what shall we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable can we use for it? It is like a mustard seed that when it is sown in the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. But once it is sown, it springs up and becomes the largest of plants and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the sky can dwell in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to understand it. Without parables, he did not speak to them, but to his own disciples, he explained everything in private. The Gospel of the Lord. I am sure that in church tonight are at least a few twins. And one of the things twins will sometimes experience is that people confuse them one for the other. And it's also possible for one of the twins to get a bit more attention than the other. And this can happen in tonight's gospel, in which we have twin parables. And one of the two is very familiar. It's the parable of the mustard seed. Our Lord makes a very simple but important point that even as the mustard seed starts very tiny, yet ultimately grows to be a large, large tree, able to provide shade and all sorts of good things. So he was trying to make the point to the early Christians, Jewish Christians, who expected that when the Messiah finally came, oh, it would be Jim Dandy a huge and obvious and immediate overthrow of everything bad and setting up everything good and all the rest. Our Lord wanted to say to those first apostles and to us, many times the way God works is with slow, small, quiet beginnings. And not to be discouraged by that. Well, if that's what our Lord wanted to say in the second parable about the uh, uh, mustard seed, why did he offer another parable that seems so similar? It's about planting seeds, it's about growing stuff, it's about harvest and all the rest. What is distinct to that other twin? Because these are not identical twins. That first parable the Lord uses the image of someone who goes out and plants some seed, goes to bed, gets up, goes to bed again, and on and on, and in all of that, watches the seed come up, as our Lord says, on its own. First the blade, then the stalk, then the corn on the grain, and so forth. What's the purpose of that parable, as distinct from the more famous one? It is a very important message, not just for the first Christians, but for all of us. And for all of us in many ways. For those of us who are busy beavers, eager to do all sorts of good things, that's great. But it's a reminder that the gospel has its own power. And in the end, it's not a matter of me or you or committees or all sorts of church stuff. Jesus Christ knows where the grace is. 
and he will bring fruit from that grace. Some of us, it's meant to be a parable of hope and encouragement because we can get all kinds of discouraged about conditions in the church. Oh, it's so terrible. All these dirty, rotten scoundrels running around. And then we remember that there was a dirty, rotten scoundrel at the Last Supper. His name was Judas. And in the Acts of the Apostles, we had more of these rotten creatures. And in every era of the church, there has been outrage and scandal. Not to justify it. Not to say then it's okay. But sometimes I think our hope is taken away by the headlines. And go back, back, back to the Last Supper and see this is part of the equation. But it's not the whole story. The whole story is in that parable. That seed which Christ himself plants in human hearts has power to grow and push through even the obstacles. And nothing can conquer the gospel. Nothing. You know, people give interesting gifts to priests, and every once in a while I get a box of old religion books. Boy, do I want to read more books about religion. I just don't have enough of them. Old books from the 1970s, with, you know, 1970s covers. You know, that rich color combination of, like, pink and mauve. Don't send a priest books. Send him cash or desserts. They are both terrific. But every once in a while, I look at these old books, and boy, are they depressing. The future of the church from 1972, it's all going to crash. There's going to be no more church, no more mass, no more families. It's all going to go gloom and doom. The 70s were a terrific time for gloom and doom. And I'm sure these were experts studying the trends, looking at the signs and all the rest. But look at 40 years later. Look at all these young people in church tonight who were not born in 72 or even for years afterwards. Listen to what Justin said before Mass. Tonight we start this beautiful program, Totus Tuus, in which more than a hundred of our young people here will be participating all week long, learning about their Catholic faith, learning their prayers, discovering more of what it means to be a Catholic and a follower of our Lord. They didn't predict that in 1972. They predicted nothing but collapse and tragedy. And they were wrong. And they will always be wrong who predict that the church has run its course. The church is out of steam. The church is out of touch. They don't understand this parable we just heard, in which the gospel has its own power. And it's not a matter of that farmer, or that committee, or that institution. Jesus Christ has promised that the church would be here until the end of time. And yes, it gets rough sometimes. It gets ugly. It can get disgusting. But that seed is unconquerable. And for many of us tonight, we need to listen to that parable. In our own hearts, in the lives of our family members, in the lives of our church, listen to what our Lord says. That seed of its own power will bear fruit. And many of us can look around, even tonight in church, at these teenagers, at these little ones, and see that God has fulfilled his promise. Don't give up. If anyone in the church should not give up, it's folks who have read the Bible who've read church history, who've seen all sorts of experts, all sorts of powerful figures, Stalin and Hitler and all the rest, the communists, you name it, declare the end is near. God will end it when he wants to end it. 
Until then, keep on going. Keep on hoping. Keep on watching the seed of the gospel producing its fruit.